glad you could join us for our virtual session, Dirty Footprints on the Magic Carpet, the impacts of soil pollution on human health. Wherever you are at the moment, we hope you're going to enjoy this session, looking at just how valuable our soil is to life and how we can stop the degradation and restore it to full health and also ourselves. I'm Rini Windham, a former BBC journalist, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this session. We've got the pleasure of four outstanding speakers, which I'll just quickly say hello to. Matthias Brauba. Hello, Matthias. Violetta, hello, Violetta Giesen. Hello, Violetta. Unmute. Hello. Thank you. Ivano Yavarone. Hello, Yavarone. Good afternoon, Rene. And Martin Hoysik. MEP for Renew at the European Parliament. Hello, Martin. Good afternoon. Well, we'll meet you all for longer in a moment, but first a few bits of a few practical tips. Feel free to Twitter. Uh, the hashtag is EU Green Week. And if you want to ask a question, then use your Slido, which you might have been doing. Just type in slido.com into your browser and enter the code EU Green Week and then choose our session. You've got a choice of sessions. Choose 5.1, 5 colon 1. And uh, if you like someone else's question in the meantime, then click on their question. And we're also going to be doing a poll on Slido. We're web streaming this as well, so your question will come out in the webcast. So what do we expect from this session? First, a quick summary from each speaker. Then each one will make their full presentation. And finally, the most important part of all, we'll take your questions. So do keep them coming in from the very beginning. We look forward to them. So this, health, this session is about healthy soil. A quarter of the species on our planet are believed to live in the soil. And another reason why soil is so important is that it stores more carbon than is stored by the total combination of the atmosphere and vegetation. And of course, the entire quality of our food depends on it as well. And uh, what we eat has a direct effect on our health. Scientists refer to soil as the poor man's tropical rainforest because of its amazing biodiversity. We know that soil is damaged by intensive farming, by pollution, deforestation, global warming. In fact, one third of the planet's entire land is severely degraded according to a UN-backed study. So our session today will focus primarily on health, how cleaning up our soil as part of the Zero Pollution Action Plan and the new soil strategy will lead to a healthier world population. So first, a thumbnail outline from each of our speakers, starting with Matthias Brava from the World Health Organization. Matthias. Thank you, Rene, and uh, good afternoon to all participants. I would like um, at the beginning to provide you with three key messages uh, that summarize the talk I'm going to give later. And first, we have a heritage of uncontrolled environmental exploitation and industrial practices that leads to contaminated sites and they have a significant impact on environment and on health in the affected areas. The contaminated sites, that's the second key message, represents challenges but it also represents opportunities for urban development because often the places are in a central attractive area and often they have a significant size that's relevant for urban development. And the third key message is redeveloping contaminated sites has proven benefits to health, it has proven benefits to environment, but it also has social benefits. However, the lessons learned from local redevelopment experiences show that we need to integrate health aspects better into the work, to make sure that there's a consistent coordination and that is a strong challenge for many municipalities. Thank you very much, Matthias. And we're going to hear more about the challenges very soon. Next to Violetta Giesen. Violetta is from Wageningen University. Violetta. Yeah, hello to all of you. Thanks for the invitation. I will show you a little bit about pesticide pollution of soils and the environment. And I would like to try to show you how we would like to build innovative risk tools to really estimate the related risk for the environment and humans. Curious? Then listen to my presentation. 
Lovely, looking forward to it, Violetta. And now to Ivano uh, uh, Yavaroni uh, from ISS, which is the Italian Institute of Health. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from you too, Ivano. Thank you, thank you very much, Renee. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my talk will uh, concern uh, environmental health aspects of uh, a soil uh, contaminated sites. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, to say that many aspects make contaminated sites uh, a relevant environmental health issues uh, because uh, we have uh, many hazards, chemical mixtures uh, in these areas, uh, multiple agents uh, for multiple uh, uh, exposure uh, sources of exposure, and also multiple etiology of, uh, of uh, the potentially related uh, uh, diseases. Also, we have the social and health inequalities, uh, uh, impairment of ecosystems, uh, and uh, it, it is in, in many, many uh, low and, uh, and um, middle income countries, uh, we have industrial production and waste management uh, not adequately committed to sustainability. Due okay, to we look forward to a fuller revelation very soon. And last but not least, to Martin Hoisting, MEP. Uh, we'll be getting your political view, Martin. So in a nutshell. Thank you, Rene, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Indeed, I will try to prove you that, uh, yes, there are cases at least that the European Parliament is trying to listen to science, that uh, we know we have a problem uh, on many fronts with soils, and the solution needs to be really having a common European legislative framework that puts us on the right path to protect, but also uh, develop this unique heritage we have in our soils. Thank you very much, Martin. That sounds very positive. I hope it'll be very good for the future. And now we'll get into the meat of all your subjects. Um, we'll start really with Matteo Sprauba, who we just heard a little from. You are an urban geographer and environmental health expert from the World Health Organization. You work in the European Center for Environment and Health, and you're going to be taking us into contaminated sites and their effects on health. What actually happens when a contaminated site has to be redeveloped? How harmful is it to the health of the people living nearby? Those are some sobering revelations to come from you, but also some challenges and some positive ideas, I hope. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you, René. So um, I would be uh, having a, okay, the slide clicker definitely works. So mm -hmm. I would like to uh, introduce uh, first on condemnated sites and health, and then continue to the relevance of redeveloping these sites. And uh, just to start, there are across Europe, more than 700,000 contaminated sites. So that alone is a huge number to address. And WHO has addressed the health impacts of contaminated sites and health over the last decade through various types of projects. And it's clearly something that we need to have on the radar and that we do work on. I would like to summarize quickly that the contaminated sites and the health impacts, it's largely because of these sites being close to densely populated urban areas and a lot of these then have strong health impacts and strong health risks. We see these risks by significant contamination of water, soil, air and food and then they can be uh, getting into the human body through ingestion, inhalation, skin contact, uh, absorption, so there's various pathways. And then this results in a wide range of uh, potentially adverse health impacts, shorter life expectancy and a lower quality of life. So we're talking about increased uh, prevalence of cancer, about congenital anomalies and low birth weights in populations. And we talk about higher mortality rates, just to name a few. And also what has been uh, alluded to by Ivano before, we do see a lot of socioeconomical um, inequalities because it's usually the more deprived and disadvantaged areas that are living close to these sites. So it also has a uh, health dimension that is embedded in the uh, discussion on contaminated sites. Most of the work has been looking into the health impacts of contamination and contaminated sites per se on the populations residing close. But another question, uh, especially from an urban planning perspective, is what do we do with these sites in the long-term perspectives? 
And we have uh, done a project on that uh, last year at uh, the European Centre for Environment and Health, looking into the urban redevelopment of contaminated sites, compiling and reviewing the practical experience with such redevelopment projects and asking the question, what can we learn from the past redevelopment experiences and how can we make sure that the legacy of contamination that we have across all European countries does not pose future health risk? So the environmental health benefits of redeveloping these sites, uh, I would like to quickly summarize the key lessons from the project. It uh, revitalizing the contaminated land presents an opportunity, of course, for sustainable urban development and urban quality of life. It reduces at the same time the pressure and demand for natural land because we know that cities are growing, they need more space, and if we can use internal space and especially brownfields and um, contaminated sites through remediation, it does help a lot. And as I mentioned before, it has a, a triple benefit. It's addressing environmental, social, and health challenges. So by sound remediation and a redevelopment of contaminated sites, we can reduce contamination concentrations in environmental media, in our bodies, and in our food items. And one of the things that we recognize during the work is that some of the uh, remediation and redevelopment campaigns that focus on public health information campaigns, informing the residents about the work, how they can protect, what type of behavior is protecting them and their children better, that had also positive health benefits. What we also observed is that there is a strong need to increase the role of health actors and to bring in more health data. A case study collection of 28 European redevelopment uh, projects on contaminated sites showed that, of course, there's a lot of environmental and urban planning departments involved in that work, but much less than half of the projects actually had an active involvement of the health and safety authorities at local level. So there's definitely space for improvement as well as um, using data. There's, of course, a lot of environmental data, environmental assessments being done uh, in these 28 cases, but only one did do a health impact assessment and used health measures. So there's also uh, space for improvement there. And as a last slide, I would like to highlight some of the most sensitive elements that were signaled to us from the, the projects, from the ground, from local authorities and those uh, agencies in charge of the redevelopment work the examples of the lessons learned on the ground, so to say, that first it's extremely important to have a common vision between all the stakeholders. That's on the one hand within the local authority, but also with all the other stakeholders involved with the future development of the site uh, to enable a harmonized planning process. It's important to have legal frameworks that are updated and, and sound on the one hand to have technical performance standards but also to create a stable market for private stakeholders and expert companies that you need in the work. Technical aspects have been one of the main challenges often on local level there's not enough uh, records and archive data on the history of the site and also uh, the implementation of a thorough assessment of the situation of the site, the risks and the cont contaminants um, in the site is crucial to have a successful remediation. Timelines were issued as one of the practical challenges on the one hand because most of the sites have been abandoned maybe decades ago at a time when the legal frameworks were much different than today, but also because often it takes a long time for those sites to go into remediation and in the meantime a lot of things can happen on the site. The last two things would be the community involvement. There is a very strong sensitivity in local communities and it's important for local authorities to take care of that because it is important to be having a very trusted and consistent communication to the local, uh, to the local residents, which are major stakeholders on the events. And the final thing, it all comes up to the role that local authorities have it's crucial in decision making and in coordinating and managing the project. It's a huge responsibility towards the local um, community that they have. And it's, as I said before, a challenge to achieve the best outcomes on environment and health. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Matthias. You've got a huge amount of material into a short time. You mentioned local authorities, but at least in our country, local authorities are fairly understaffed and they're working flat out already. How on earth can local authorities really take on this burden? How is it realistic that they can do this on top of all their other requirements? 
Uh, well, I think it's uh, for some of the cities, um, this is something that um, if they have a lot of uh, industrial areas, uh, they probably have some uh, experience in remediating such sites, but especially for local authorities that are small, they may not have very large uh, health or environmental authorities. Um, then they may only have one or two sites that go through that redevelopment and that's extremely challenging for them. It's a very specific process. It does need uh, a specific um, method, specific skills, starting from a very clean and sound site assessment to know what are the problems and how they can be uh, uh, settled. It needs a coordination of where do we want to go with that site, what is the future use, which also has an influence on the remediation. So there's a lot of uh, capacity building and skills issues, and it's one of the things that during our project was signaled by uh, many of the projects that they do have challenges on a local level, getting all this coordinated, getting the capacities and skills they need. Often they were calling upon uh, national uh, support uh, in these projects. And we have also seen that sometimes local authorities actually team up and they build uh, public agencies with various local or regional authorities together to be able to uh, effectively work on such challenges, which uh, sometimes is too much demanding for an individual um, authority. Exactly. Thank you so much, Matthias. I'm sure that will also be eliciting questions on Slido uh, about cleaning up. And I think there's a huge amount to ask. So thank you very much. And we're now going on to our next speaker, who is Violetta Giesen from Wageningen University. And Violetta will be looking at pesticide residues in European agricultural soils and how this risks our health. That's the direct subject of the whole of our talk, but she's really at the nub of it here, Violetta. 83% of agricultural soils in Europe are polluted, polluted with pesticide residues, most of them with different cocktails. Recent German studies found residue cocktails in air and dust, even in areas where there had no, not been any spraying at all of pesticides. So the exact environmental and human health risk is unknown. Violetta will explain more. Over to you, Violetta. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, could you please share the, my slides? Because I can't use this uh, tool. Next slide. As you have heard about, 83% of European agricultural soils are containing pesticide residues. But how many pesticides do you expect in, in Europe? to be approved on the market. We have 500 different active substances approved on the market, together forming 2,000 different pesticides. In food, 44% uh, is containing pesticides. And often we are talking about the so-called cocktails. That means we are not talking about one pesticide, but about cocktails and in soils, 60% contain um, cocktails with maximum 13 different residues. And in food, 27% contain cocktails with until a maximum of 25 different pesticide residues in one piece of food. Next slide. But how does it happen? Pesticides are there to treat against pests, diseases and against weeds. But how do they then come into the soil, into food, into our environment? If pesticides are applied, a part of this comes to the target organisms that are meant to be killed or destroyed. But the rest enters and either into soil, can be leached to groundwater, can be run, uh, taken by runoff or erosion to surface water bodies, and as well can be uh, by volatilization, we call this, uh, come into the air. These processes are all modeled uh, to, before these pesticides are approved to the market. These are part of the EFSA approval procedure to see where we detect these pesticides in the environment. However, the transport by dust, and that is what we now in this time of the year, when we find our windows dirty, this dust comes often from fields and the finest fraction of this dust is directly lung relevant and we know that this finest fraction uh, accumulates pesticides residues which are accumulated as well in soils and therefore humans are directly exposed to this dust because we inhalate this and as well animals 
So the question is now, what is the effect of these cocktails, which are in the environment, on environmental health, but as well on human health? Next slide, please. I will give you one example. In the last uh, 10 years, maybe there have been a lot of publications on the decline of insects. Uh, we know that insecticides, uh, several of these insecticides uh, kill bees. There was a strong discussion in the European Union in the last years. But as well, we find out that in 70% of the studies that pesticides negatively uh, affect soil organisms, and 80% of the studies show that we have a change on the community structure of the soils. What does it mean? Is it a risk? Is it bad? As in the beginning, um, we heard the soils are a living environment and a healthy soil has a long, a strong resilience. We found there the good ones. These are the organisms in the soil that help plants to grow. They make nutrients available and strengthens plants. And we have the bad ones. The bad ones are the pathogens that affect plant growth. They are mainly fungi, fungi, fungi that affect crops. So what happens if a herbicide, for example, is applied? Next, please. Then, boom. It feels like a bomb into the good ones and often destroys the good ones. Mm -hmm. And the bad ones remain. But what happens then? The equilibrium in the soil is disturbed and therefore the bad ones take over and they attack plants. And then the farmer, what he sees, is more fungis in the, in the crops. And what happens? Farmers apply more fungicides to kill the fungis. So the whole cycle is disturbed then. That is one example of what happens in the environment. We go to the next slide. So we look what is the risk for human health? I'm not a toxicologist, but I would like to show you uh, what I have found in literature, which is very interesting. We all know that um, from several pesticides, there is a very controversial uh, discussion on potential human health effects. And what we can see here, that pe uh, pesticides, not all, but several of them, can uh, affect the endocrine disruption as men make endocrine disruption, they can affect reproductivity, they can be mutagenous, they can, can have various effects in the human bodies, which are summed here. And this can lead to cancer, to Alzheimer, to different diseases as Parkinson as well. It is a controversial discussion, as I said. That means if we would apply the precautionary principle that these active substances should not be on the market until it is 100% proven that they are not harmful for human health. We would need other approvals for active substances to be allowed as pesticides in the European market. Next slide. So what we are going to do now, we have a, a big project financed by the European Commission, which is called SPRINT. And what we are going to do, we would like to, uh, together with EFTA and other stakeholders what are, who are interested to work with us to develop innovative fate and transport models that really predict the fate of pesticides, including dust, transport by dust, and the resulting exposure of humans, as well as validate existing models on field scale and see how we can innovate them. And furthermore, what is very important for us, we would like to make an innovative risk assessment, taking the cocktails of the pesticides into consideration and their effects on new endpoints, as well for the environment, as well for humans. And there we will as well take factors like resilience into consideration. And last but not least, we would like, we are going to plan to build risk maps for whole Europe to see which regions present which risk for the environment and for humans and what should be done. Next slide. And that leads, uh, next. Yeah, you can just go through the next slide, please. Um, then we come to the, the idea of Sprint. We would like to have you all on board of the Sprint transition train. This transition train 
is meant to join people from all different stakeholders. That means starting from the chemical industry to biological shops to robotica producers. We would like policymakers to have on board. You can see here the whole food chain of people to together form a transition in Europe in the view of the farm to fork strategy. So please, if you would like to join us, next slide. You can participate in our stakeholder event, which will virtually take place the 22nd of June. You can inscribe if you put, uh, uh, on this link. And we hope that we'll really get a full people on our train to together develop sustainable farming in Europe. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much indeed, Violetta, and I would jump on your sprint train pretty quickly. Um, it's good to hear that somebody's getting a grip on it, because for ages people have been pussyfooting around, oh, well, we're using pesticides, we're using things that kill bees and so on. But to hear that you're actually proving it and getting a grip on it is, is very comforting. Before I ask you a direct question, um, it's time for people to do a poll. So if you look at um, your Slido 5.1 in our group, then a question should come up, which I will read to you. Um, it's, uh, what is the percentage of pesticide residues in organically farmed soil? Is it A, there are no pesticides at all in organically farmed soil? B, 50% fewer pesticides in organically farmed soil than in conventional soil, or C, up to 90% fewer pesticides in organically farmed soil than in conventional soil. So now I, I will repeat that very quickly. A, no pesticides at all, B, 50% fewer, or C, 90% fewer pesticides. So while people are looking at Slido and answering the question, in the meantime, I'll look at the poll myself. Um, the, uh, the question to you, Violetta, well, so many really, but um, what is the relationship between the pesticides in soils and the pesticides in food? How much of it gets translated into what we're eating? That is very specific, but what you can see as well as it relates as well to the question with organic farming and organic food, we see the main ratio. I don't say the, the result now from your question, but we can see that uh, more or less in organic food, we have um, the main ratio related to conventional food than we have it in soils. And um, what we can see is that um, there are specific, for example, DDTs, which are still present in Europe. They have been forbidden in 1973 in most, most countries of, of Western Union. They are still in 30% of the soils and they accumulate specifically in a courgette uh, and in mm. cucumber. So that depends really on the, on the specific pesticides um, which uh, glyphosate, for example, accumulates in genetically modified um, crops. So that depends really on which crop and which, uh, which uh, pesticide you are talking about. But they don't, they, it, in earlier times it was an idea, they come to the soil, they stay in the soil and they are immobilized. That is not true. Thank you. That's quite sobering, really. And uh, we did mention earlier that if, if, do you think it's realistic to ask people to eat less meat? Because meat, of course, they're eating crops. Crops might have been sprayed as well. Um, is our whole way, our diet, uh, would that influence a healthier way of living and possibly require fewer pesticides? And that is for sure, because we have uh, different theories. One theory is we have to use the uh, uh, soils very much more intensively for, agri for more intensive agriculture. And the other idea is just eat less meat and then you don't need so much uh, area for food production. And if I look at my daughters and the generation of 16 to 18 years old, they are all veget vegetarians and they, are, yes. they don't want meat, but others, the older generation, think without uh, beef in the, day, in the day, there is no day. Maybe we can find there some middle way uh, to as well find a healthier uh, um, feeding food for, for, for us and as well uh, then conserve the environment. I think it's a very good point. People are getting much more 
aware now of eating more of a vegetarian diet or a flexitarian diet. And even in France, great meat eating, they never used to eat many vegetables. Suddenly everywhere on the radio, they're saying, oh, eat more vegetables and we must be more vegetarian, which is like a total revolution. So thank you, you're ahead of the game, Violetta. Let's see now if our Slido poll uh, answers are ready. Um, yes. Ah, so many of you seem to think that uh, there was no, that, uh, oh, mind you, no, you got it right, 90%, that is absolutely right. Thank you, all of you, 90% fewer pesticides because organic soil cannot be totally free and there is a small amount permitted, which is terrible, but it is. Um, so we, the, the ones who guessed that there were none, unfortunately, are wrong. 50% would have been too much, but 90% fewer pesticides in or pesticides in organically farmed soil. So we're on the way, and I just hope that a whole load of young, new, keen farmers realise the benefits of organic cultivation and have an aim of organic soil. Thank you very much for doing the poll. And now we'll pass on to our next speaker. Um, thank you, Violetta, as well for your answers. So continuing on the subject of the relationship between soil and human health, Ivano Yavaroni from Italy, Ivano's head of the Social Epidemi Epidemiology Unit at the ISS, the um, Italian Institute of Health. And Ivano, your research looks at how contaminated sites affect people who are living close by, which follows very nicely on from what Matthias was talking about. And um, you're going to relay your findings to the World Health Organization. And you've called your presentation today, Environmental Health in Contaminated Sites from a National Project to a European Cost Action. Cost stands for Cooperation in Science and Technology. Ivano, good to hear from you. I'm looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rene. And I'd like to, to start by saying that the, the, the the issue of uh, human health in, uh, in contaminated sites uh, is uh, polyhedric, is uh, multifaceted, because uh, it, it concerns uh, problem framing, uh, study design, uh, methodology, uh, interpretation of, of results in terms of uh, implementation of uh, activities uh, from a policy and remediation point of view. These dimensions are often separately addressed in the real context. And it is one, this is one of the main reasons why a comprehensive approach to the problems is still lacking. There are several aspects that make contaminated sites relevant public health issues. I'd like to, 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 to say among, among these factors that it, it, it contaminated areas, uh, soil contamination is often, very often, uh, a concern uh, heterogeneous hazards and uh, chemical mixtures uh, that uh, can be found not only in the soil but also in the air, in the water bodies, uh, and uh, in the in the food chain. Mm -hmm. We have uh, multiple agents for multiple sources of uh, exposure, and many many contaminated areas. Uh, are uh, very close to uh, populated uh, uh, sites uh, with the high expected uh, health impacts. And uh, another distinct and important feature of contaminated sites is that we have uh, healthy impacts concerning uh, diseases uh, with uh, multiple etiology. And this makes it difficult to disentangle uh, the attributable risk uh, health risk to specific uh, uh, sources of contamination. Another uh, distinctive important uh, characteristic of uh, contaminated sites, contaminated soils, is uh, that in areas contaminated by industrial production, industrial emissions, or by, by waste uh, disposals, uh, we, we have marked inequalities in many cases, and we have a, a deprivation gradient uh, a, 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 a around the pop, a, a in population living around these sites. So for these, for these reasons, the, the issues of human health in the contaminated sites uh, should be best uh, addressed with a, a strong uh, sustainability perspective. 
we need from one side to take into account uh, the, 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 the evidence on the health effects, health impacts on the human population. But on the other hand, we need to consider also the broader context of contaminated sites and the environmental and the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem health, but also the social environment, including the occupational opportunities that arise from, from industrial activity and, and production. So these, all these aspects uh, strongly require an intersectoral approach. And this has to be seen as a, as a part of, of a social negotiation because we have legitimate needs from many actors. We have vulnerable groups, children, pregnant women, residents, workers, but also we have investors, business, and, and industrial activities. And all these aspects must be taken into account in a non-discriminatory process. The, the, the issue of a human health, uh, 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 the, the human health in, uh, in um, contaminated sites uh, is, a, is, a, is a, 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 an important point uh, that uh, has been addressed for, for many years by the WHO Collaborating Center uh, on Environmental Health uh, in Contaminated Sites at ISS is in, with a strict collaboration with uh, Matthias and uh, and the, and the WHO European Center for Environment Health in Bonn. And, uh, and uh, thanks to this uh, strong collaboration, we, we launched uh, an, a, a cost action, a cost action, a network, a European network on uh, industrially contaminated sites and health, involving many the environmental health and the universities across 33 countries. I like to say that the, the networking activities carried out by the cost action contributed to the inclusion for the first time of contaminated sites and waste as a, 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 an environmental one of the eight environmental health priority areas in the declaration of the last ministerial conference of the 53 uh, ministries of health environment uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the countries in the, the, the WHO European region. And there is, a, I, I like to underline that there is, a, for the first time, a, a, an important commitment in, in the Ostrava Declaration pointing to the need to prevent and eliminate the adverse environmental and health effects caused and inequalities related to contaminated sites and waste management. And, uh, and uh, I think, uh, I think uh, we, there is a still a urgent need uh, to develop a portfolio for action at national and international level to support primary prevention intervention. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, we need a very a strong effort to adopt uh, uh, common and shared methodologies uh, to face uh, the, the problem of the health impact of contaminated sites. And we need to adopt uh, a surveillance systems to look at the changes in the health profile of population residing in contaminated areas, as we did in Italy with the Centeri project. And as we are going to do with a new project at European level, which is looking at the uh, uh, the childhood cancer incidents uh, and cancer incidents uh, in adolescents and uh, uh, young people living in the most polluted, uh, contaminated areas uh, uh, in, in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivano. And unfortunately, very often the most contaminated areas are also the poorest areas of the country. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, we hardly need to measure because we know that they're terribly polluted, but at least with your surveillance, you will prove it and hopefully action will follow pretty swiftly. Now, instead of asking you one of my questions, we've got such a big pile here that I will put one from Paul Tuck from the Environment Agency in Luxembourg, who has asked an obvious question for all of you, but I will ask it to you, Ivano. How do you define a contaminated site? Yes. Oh, thank you for, for, for your question, René. I mean, 
this is one of the, the, the most difficult uh, topic. The, 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 we, we know Briefly. that <laughs> we know we know that the definition of a contaminated site uh, uh, is uh, traditionally um, based on on uh, soil contamination, on uh, on uh, the, the level of uh, soil contaminants above some reference values. But when we talk about uh, contaminated sites, uh, we should keep in our mind that uh, it, from, from a schematic uh, uh, point of view, it, it's important to distinguish between soil contamination, hair contaminants, uh, food chain contaminants. But in the real uh, uh, case scenario, in the real life, uh, the, the uh, contaminated sites should uh, include, should include, uh, should go over the, the, the classification, should include uh, uh, um, should 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 the uh, 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 go over the the the, the mere con, con, uh, classification? I mean, uh, we we need to identify uh, contaminants across different uh, uh, sectors of the environment, and uh, we mentioned the inequalities, uh, for instance, in terms of risk from uh, from uh, from uh, living uh, in in, uh, in uh, deprived areas close to waste uh, disposal and uh, I, I, I think uh, I think that we should move uh, toward uh, uh, over a, a more a more comprehensive uh, definition of uh, contaminated sites and not only in, in concerning soil but uh, all uh, the, the environmental media. Thank you very much Ivana that was a very comprehensive answer as well. So we've heard from three of our speakers we've looked at soil contamination from the health perspective we've looked at the soil itself with pesticide residues and industrial contamination and the urgency of making changes but of course a lot of that depends on the political will. So our final speaker will give us some of that aspect. Martin Hoysik is an MEP who's been active in environmental protection for more than 25 years. He's now concentrating on hazardous chemicals, climate and biodiversity diversity and animal welfare. With green targets in mind, Martin, let's hear the policy of the European Parliament on polluted soil and how we can protect it. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for the invitation to this very interesting talk, because indeed soils, somehow I think some, they are a bit forgotten uh, in, in the Union because we like a comprehensive legal framework. We have the Water Framework Directive, we have the uh, air uh, covered, but the soils are missing. There was an attempt uh, that was sadly not completed because of the unwillingness of the member states, but I now hope that with the Green Deal, uh, with the realization that we really face an emergency, both in case of climate as well as the environment, uh, and there's an ambition that we need to meet for our own sake. It's not for just for the sake of you know, environment, nature, which for me would be good enough, but it's for our own sake as a humanity that we will find a way to have a good framework which will help us, for example, to define what actually is a contaminated site because we like those things. Now, let me take you a step, slightly a step back about kind of an understanding from what the experts are saying in my own experience. And an, an example of contaminated site we have in Eastern Slovakia a place where there is a former PCB polyphosphate biphenyls uh, production site, which is now a globally banned group of chemicals. Uh, they stopped production 40 years ago, and there is still uh, contamination. There's still drums of these toxic chemicals buried in the forest, leaking into the soil. And it's still going on. It's actually a unique site which the scientists around the world are studying on the effect on the local population. And this is just one of thousands of places that are contaminated across Europe. And one of the pressures we have, because at the same time, we are polluting soils with hazardous pesticides, not only uh, applied in agriculture, but also uh, biocides used elsewhere. We have pressure from different hazardous chemicals, which are highly persistent biocumulative, like, for example, the, some of the perfluorinated chemicals. And last but not least, all this is compounded by the climate emergency that we face that also has an impact. Now, you said 
soil is a poor man's rainforest. I think it's not just poor man's. It's actually, I don't want to say rich man's because it's, in, it's, it's, it's a rainforest on its own. It's, in, it's life. If you would take life out of the soil, you would take life out of our planet. And we all depend on it. This is something which is, which is if, you, if I would like to encourage the, the viewers when this session is over, of course, to go outside and get a handful of soil. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to imagine how much life is in there. And that's why I believe we need a unified approach across the union. And that's what we called for as a European Parliament, to not have it only in vague promises and the targets that, you know, can be mi mixed, missed because they are not binding, but a very firm legislative framework that will help us. We need to uh, deal not just with the pollution, we need to deal also with the storing of the carbon because the best carbon sink in the world we have is our soil. We have to actually help the farmers to put the carbon back to the soil rather than what is the current situation, have it contributing and leaving the soil and contributing to the climate change. And of course, uh, we need to make sure that we protect the biodiversity of the soil, that we don't cover the soil, that we don't take destroy the soil, but we ensure that the biodiversity in the soil is protected. And I believe that co collaboration on the union level is the best way forward because we then can also respect and understand the differences. Because of course, the soil in my native Slovakia is even different between different regions. So across the Europe, we have this unique diversity, but that shouldn't prevent us from taking a joint action. And I really hope that what we will see from the commission is not just the good thematic strategy, but a bold step. And I expect, and I'm seeing more and more from member states willingness and openness to go for a joint approach. And I hope that we will see it. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. That's right, absolutely spot on, makes a lot of sense. I was shocked to hear about 40 years of contamination and still uh, pollutants leaking into the soil after that long. Um, and how would you say that this whole idea, because at the moment it seems to be very piecemeal, as you say, in different regions, there doesn't seem to be a Europe-wide umbrella. Um, but how do you think it fits in with a Green Deal? That, will that be the umbrella that incorporates the soil aspect as well? I think this fits in a Green Deal perfectly. It's not mentioned because politically Commission was cautious after what happened before. Now, for me, now the clear signal from the Parliament and is that we want it. Uh, at the beginning of this Commission, uh, the President Ursula von der Leyen promised us that when Parliament calls for legislation, the Commission will propose it, and it will actually connect the various dots. That's, uh, for me, important part is that it's not going to be scattered in different pieces of legislation, but really will provide kind of the roof that will protect the soil or the, or the protection uh, for the soil across different threats, and not impose, but, but guide and help to make soil protection really something which is an important part of the Europe. Thank you. That sounds very hopeful and I very much hope that all your fellow parliamentarians feel the same. Now the time, we've had an audience question which I used already, but we've got quite a few more now. Uh, there's one for Violetta here from Annelise Vogt. Violetta, can you use the cocktail process you're developing also for other contaminant cocktails or is it just for pesticides? No, we will uh, develop an overall approach. And this approach uh, consists of resilience, reproductivity, and diseases. And we uh, will define specific endpoints, uh, which then can be used as well for other, other cocktails. We focus on pesticides because we can't cover the world. But uh, this idea, the concept, um, will be as well, can be as well applied for other contaminants. That's hopeful, thank you. And another question here, which is um, an anonymous question, but it's a good one. I know the polluter pays principle. Is that principle incorporated in the regulation of contaminated sites? Matthias, perhaps. 
Well, that, that's a very good question because in theory it should be and uh, I can't really comment on all the legislation and regulations around contaminated sites, but taken from uh, our project where we have uh, looked into the, the challenges and difficulties that uh, cities had on a local level, it is uh, certainly not 100% a reality. It's uh, something that should work in, in, uh, in theory, but maybe it doesn't really work that well in practice. From the 28 case studies, and I just looked it up, uh, we had only two where the remediation costs were actually uh, carried by um, the private companies uh, formally in charge of uh, the contamination. And one of those two actually was a case where uh, the private company kept ownership of the site and the rest was largely funded by uh, local authorities, national and other funding schemes. Mm -hmm. So that might be a little bit because uh, of the selection of the case studies, we were largely addressing local authorities and this is why uh, there could be a bias in that data. But I think from just the reporting from the different case studies, uh, there have been various cases where um, they find contamination in the ground only at a very large, uh, late stage. I think it also links to the timelines I indicated before as one of the issues. So um, what we got as, a, as an impression is that, uh, that there seems to be a lot of pressure on when the site closes on checking that there is no contamination. Um, and that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, so maybe there could be more uh, emphasis on enforcement of all the environmental uh, legislations during the operation phase to make sure that uh, there is no contamination piling up and accumulating on the site. But then again, a lot of these contaminated sites are products of the past. They have been operating under legal frameworks of the 60s and the 70s, so they are not similar to today's frameworks. But in practice, uh, there seems to be um, space for improvement again on making the uh, polluter pace principle work across the board. Um, and I think there's a lot of calls for, for regulations to uh, cover all different types of contaminating activities. Uh, different legal tools exist. They don't necessarily cover all the uh, contaminating activities. So there's uh, certainly some loopholes in there and uh, cities at the moment are facing these challenges. Thank you very much, Matthias. I think, Martin, you really, it's almost what you were saying, really, that the regulation at the moment does seem to be quite piecemeal. And do you see signs that we will really have a much stronger reinforcement because it's much more urgent now and uh, it still seems to be in little drips and drabs everywhere? Martin. I definitely have hope. Uh, I don't, I'm always cautioned about kind of having big promises and kind of having very big expectations. I think what we need to do is really work and, and try to, to try to make our best possible effort to achieve it. And discussions like these are definitely something which helps us to achieve it in my view, because it becomes really topic of public discourse. And just a small note on the contaminated sites and polluter pays here. This is for me also about elementary justice that we need for not just the environment, but for the people living around these sites, because they are those who are impacted by the pollution. And this is where I think we really have to be stronger in enforcing the polluter pace principle. But as you said, we have at the moment quite a piecemeal legislation, and this is another reason for me to have really a joint and proper uh, legal framework for souls in Europe. Uh, Violetta has something to add. Yeah, I would say it is often for the polluter pays if you look at certain contaminated sites. But who pays for the dust contamination with pesticides, for example? This is easy to say, okay, here we have a local contamination and then we know the people who have done it. Uh, but who will help us to clean the environment and who pays for this? And where is the precautionary principle by diffuse contamination? And I really would appreciate if the European Union could, as we're convinced in this case, the member states to come up there with the soil legislation, which was not approved in 2007 or 8 because the member states, they made their veto. So I think it's time because if we do not have any legislation, there is no any reason for any polluters to stop with it. And even uh, people who are producing pesticides and big companies, they told me, look, if we get new rules, we will follow them. But if the policymaker don't give us rules, why should we do change? And that is logical. So it's That's great. It's good that you're all, 
it, it's yeah. wonderful that you can all get at each other now at the right place and, and possibly liaise later and for and make this a lot stronger the legislation than it is at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Ivano, you wanted to add something quick. Oh. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Yes, the, the, the issue of uh, polluters pay principle is uh, really, really important. I would like to add that, that we evaluating the health impact of uh, contaminated sites uh, uh, introduce also the temporal dimension of a contamination. I mean, in many, many, many contaminated sites, uh, we have uh, a contamination started decades ago, while uh, we have an impact in terms of diseases, long latency diseases. I mean, uh, diseases that uh, we can measure just, uh, uh, for instance, uh, lung cancer, uh, blood cancer, we can measure this kind of uh, risk uh, some decades after the contamination has finished. So it's important to look at uh, the current risk, even though the exposure ref refers to uh, decades uh, earlier. Thank you. We've got a very quick question, um, which I think will probably be aimed at Martin. How do you, very quickly, Martin, how do you ensure that a soil framework directive will not be blocked again, especially by countries with existing legislation? I think two reasons. Uh, one thing is that I see a change in the attitudes of countries, and one of the largest blockers, UK, has sadly left the union. But the other thing is... <laughs> Um, Very sad. Sad, but true. Uh, I'm sad as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, the other thing is, I believe that uh, there is more and more realization that we have a problem, and and this approach is seen more and more as setting the minimum standard, and something that the countries can go about, that the countries can be stricter. So it's not about undermining, but actually improving what the countries are doing and giving more a level playing field across the union. I think this is benefiting everybody. Right. Well, there's so much material today. So what I'd like to do is a brief sentence from each of you as we're coming to the end on your hopes, your uh, the positive side, what you think will happen. Uh, starting with really quick, Matthias, from you. Okay, so I, I think as a summary or like a, a perspective in the future, I think what is most important is that contaminated sites have been put on the radar of many countries on policy making and environmental research. There's a lot of things that need to come on legislation, on practice. I think uh, it is a rising issue and it's most importantly uh, that it's on the radar, that it's on the agenda, that has been achieved and that's the foundation for any further steps to come. That's very hopeful. You have put it on the agenda. Viol Violetta? Yeah, I have uh, big hope in the farm to fork strategy and uh, to the zero pollution with the biodiversity strategy. And uh, I hope that we can get all stakeholders together, avoid this lobbying and fighting against each other and losing forces, but go together for a better future. That's yep. my hope. I totally agree. Thank you very much, Violetta. Um, and I Ivano, please. Yes, yes, I'd like to say that in many, many situations, uh, we, uh, we are asked to produce more epi epidemiological evidence of the impact of contaminated sites. And uh, these uh, actually cannot be proposed to postpone remediation activities because in many contaminated sites, we have mixtures of chemical of a toxicological interest. They are carcinogenic. So, we have full our evidence to act and not to postpone activities. Thank you, Ivana. That's very positive. And finally, Martin, from the political view where you can really act. Well, on one hand, I hope that in a year's time we will have a similar discussion. We'll be discussing what should be in the upcoming proposal, but we should not wait for the framework. I will hope that we will see action starting now already possibly using the recovery and resilience package and that we'll see that the new uh, financial framework will actually contribute to healing source rather than ongoing destruction. Thank you very much. Well, that is a very positive way on which 
to end today. It's been terrific to hear so much. I must admit that before studying this subject a little, I didn't realize how much soil was important to our life. It really has opened my eyes and I hope it's opened the eyes of everybody watching and that you will spread the word. I also hope, as you very well said, Martin, that there will be a, a much stronger directive that will cover the whole of Europe for once and that we will really work towards decontaminating our soil very quickly because you can see how urgent it is. It's urgent for health, it's urgent for food, urgent for the way we live, and we have been rather unaware of how important it is. So thank you ever so much, virtual audience. I can't see you, but I hope you've enjoyed this session as much as we have. Um, and uh, certainly you've come up with some jolly good questions. I've used most of them, but there are a couple I haven't managed to get around to. Sorry about that. Um, and also a huge thanks to each one of you, to Matthias, to Violetta, to Ivano, and to Martin, all of you excellent speakers, and you've really brought out a huge number of new facts, even discovering the hour that we've had, which is very limited. Also, thanks to our technicians, our offstage moderators, and to the session organizer, Bavo, as well as Monica, Mirko, Daniel, and Azuro from Teamworks. Well, coming up next after the break will be today's very last session, um, a choice of three actually, maximizing national recovery plans, water pollution, and zero pollution and the new horizon Europe. But for now, on behalf of the Director General for the Environment of the European Commission, thanks very much for watching. Thanks to everybody, and it's been wonderfully uplifting to hear a good ending and a bit of positive news. Thank you all, and. Goodbye.